This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 514, recorded on October 5th, 2018. I'm Vincent Rackenyellow, and you are listening to the podcast All About Viruses. Joining me here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks. Nice day. Beautiful day. It's amazing how the weather affects the way you feel. You've had some miserable days with rain and hot and muggy, and today is perfect. I would say it's perfect. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. How are you doing? Okay. I'm happy to be back. I was in Mexico for the International Adenovirus Meeting, mm-hmm. and it was great. It was mm-hmm. a really good meeting in a hacienda where they filmed part of the Bolivian scenes of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, <laughs> <laughs> although I, I never quite figured out where. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, the food was great. The science was great. We, nice. I spent a couple of days in, in Mexico City, and we saw mm-hmm. lots of archaeological sites and museums and great good food yeah it was good also joining us from western massachusetts alan dove good to be here alan. and it is gorgeous weather today it's yes. clear blue sky 62 fahrenheit 17 c just lovely on my travels i often hear about the weather on twiv <laughs> <laughs> at my recent travel this week to stanford right most of the students did not like the weather in the beginning of time. Really? Probably because their weather is so much better. <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> their there's weather the is, same. <laughs> it's always the same. It's That's the same. right. Yeah, but interestingly, I, this so I said, okay, no more weather. And then one student who uh, had actually taken my virology course and uh, told me this before I went, she, she ended up going to Stanford. She said, I kind of like hearing what it's like in different places. Yeah. <laughs> well, here it's really wild because today, this morning, it was low of 43, Oof. and it's going to be 59. Now, tomorrow, it's going to be high of 80. Then mm, Sunday, wow. yes, it's going to be see? back to high of 64. That's Monday, oh back God. to high of 79. Lord. It's just crazy. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I say we do an experiment. Just let's not do the weather for six weeks. And see if anyone cares. Oh. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't know. You can always bleep it out. You know, can you edit, edit the, it the, out? The only thing that it. keeps it going for me is that when people write in, they always send in the weather, which means yeah, they must like it, right? This is yeah. very true. But what some people say is that they want to get to the science. And of course, that's what the timestamps are for. You can, yeah. Right? You can skip over it. Yes, skip over it. That's right. We have a little announcement from Graham Hatful, professor at. University of Pittsburgh, who was on TWIV 87, a fireside chat with Professor Graham Hatfield. And he runs what is called the Sea Phages program, which at the time we did our TWIV was called FIRE. (laughs) They decided to change the name. It's a program where uh, it's instituted in high schools and you get to uh, isolate. So they went from fire to water. (laughs) Went from fire to water. You (laughs) You get to isolate phages from the dirt and grow them up and characterize them, sequence them, name them. Mm. It's called Sea Phages. started in 2008, and they, they accept applications to the program. It is currently at 130 institutions, and they have 5,000 students a year. That's amazing. So, of course, the whole thing is to get students doing some science, and phage is a great way to do that. And the goal is to explore the diversity of phages, how they evolve, and students get to name the phage. Dixon, if you isolated a phage and could name it, what would you call it? <laughs> I'll have to think about that one. Vertical? <laughs> no, I'd call it trichinella <laughs> spiralis. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would call it, to be honest. I really don't. So, um, DDD. DDD. <laughs> uh, Vincent, you, you said high schools, but you meant college because it's undergraduates that do this. Maybe there's some high school programs, you know, but the ones yeah, I know of are about are the, there are some high, there are college. some there are some high schools too. But I guess okay. the main program is uh, undergraduates. Yeah, that's less so interesting. Yeah, it is undergraduate. From, You're right. Yeah, yeah. And so my student, uh, my graduate student uh, Danielle, was in this program at Hope 
and she got to name they got to name their fate. It was, she was in a group and they named it Marsha because where do you think it was isolated from? From a marsh. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Uh-huh. Marsha Fage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there is a program for high schools, though. Maybe it's mm-hmm. called something else. Anyway, mm-hmm. but high school would be great, too, right? Oh, absolutely. All right. So they uh, want to, uh, yeah, here it says, the goal is to inspire early career undergraduates with authentic research experiences, not, not concocted ones from right. the lab, right? Fresh persons. They call them. Mm -hmm. And the institutions that are currently involved range from community colleges to R1 universities. An R1 university is one that has R1s or what? What's an R1? Research one, meaning that research is a primary emphasis for the university. Mm -hmm. Is is, uh, Columbia is Columbia is an R1 university. um, University of Michigan is an R1 university. Big, big universities. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. when someone isolates a phage from soil, how do they know it hasn't already been described and named? Well, sequence, sequence, sequence would be it. it. Yeah. Okay. So the, you don't get to name it if it's already been named. Obviously, you know, I think the likelihood of that happening is pretty remote, especially well, if you've also, got people all over the place doing this. I but also wanted to ask that yeah. if you've done enough, and I don't know what enough is, you'd start <laughs> <laughs> doing that. But I think it's we have a ways to go before that happens, right? Hmm. Okay. Anyway, there's a paper in PNAS which describes the program and its impact. We'll put a link in the show notes. Mm. So a new member, you'll be trained in phage discovery and genomics. So you, you have to apply to get in this. There's a deadline of October 31st. And the faculty apply, by the way. Faculty apply, not the right. students. Yes. So you want to get your institution into this, right? Right. Because mm. they'll train you. They'll say, here's how it works. Here's the program. And uh, there are application materials online, hhmi.org slash S-E-A, or you could send an email info at cphages.org. The deadline is Halloween. <laughs> mm. It's true. Uh, there are several kinds of these undergraduate programs for freshman biology courses. So I know that they do something here where the students uh, go on certain kinds of uh, carbohydrate types of diet or, or things and they look at their microbiome uh-huh. and then I think there's I think there's one somewhere that's uh, that's yeast based or something so that's it's not just you do your canned bio 101 labs instead you do these research oriented labs mm-hmm. it's pretty cool Neat. Mm-hmm. All right. and I looked up research one in university <laughs> Carnegie classification of institutions of higher uh-huh. education oh my gosh there are uh, 115 <laughs> in the U.S. They offer a rain, full range of baccalaureate programs, are committed to graduate education through the doctorate, give high priority to research, award 50 or more doctoral degrees each year, and receive annually $40 million or more in federal support. So it's kind of like Fortune 500 companies. There is a list. <laughs> you know, I, I heard this only on TWIV not too long ago, mm-hmm. and I didn't know I was at an R1 university. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's even a map on the Wikipedia page. So, In fact, yeah. now that I know all this, I wouldn't be a part of an R1 that would have me. <laughs> <laughs> too late. <laughs> yeah, way too late. What's up, what's up with ASV, Kathy? Oh, uh, two things. The members got email about nominations for the Ann Palmenberg Junior Investigator Awards. No, so nominations uh, are, can be put in. There's information about that on the ASV webpage. And also, members got information about if you want to uh, suggest someone to run for one of the offices for ASV, um, there are a couple of council positions and a president-elect position. So you can submit those to Stacey Schultz-Cherry. Dixon, you're too old to be nominated. I'm sorry. I'm not being discriminatory. Darn. It's just a fact. Darn. <laughs> we have a little follow-up. Jay writes, Twivumverit. While listening to TWIV 512, I was inspired to do a search on plant bioinformatics and came upon the best URL ever. And this is the Lawrence Dill Plant Informatics and Computation Lab at Iowa State. And the the URL is (laughs) dill-pickle.org. That's great. (laughs) Dillpickle.org. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes. Thanks for your hard work. Kathy, take the next one, please. John writes, I really enjoyed your second conversation with Ann Simon on TWIV 512. Regarding public perception of transgenic crops, it is worth noting that Bayer 
acquired Monsanto this year. Low commodity prices have been driving consolidation in the industry. See also ChemChina Syngenta and DuPont Dow. It should be interesting to see if the disappearance of the name Monsanto affects perception at all. In a historical echo, the European Union Court of Justice recently ruled that CRISPR gene-edited plants will need to go through the same stringent approval process as transgenic plants. And he sends a news piece by Ewan Calloway. This decision runs counter to the regulatory environment that is emerging in the U.S., where the USDA has indicated that a number of gene-edited crops will not be regulated as transgenic. Plum pox virus and two Gemini viruses are on the list of top plant viruses that Dixon picked back on TWIV 274. I did? <laughs> yeah, there's okay, a link there. You can <laughs> click through. Um, also included on the list is potato virus Y, the namesake for the genus Podivirus and family Podiviridae. Isn't that great? Potato virus Y. Potato virus Y. Pody. We, we never addressed last time with Anne why it was a Podivirus, but there you go. Yep. Okay, so, so someone had mentioned that yeah, in the U.S., these edited crops won't be transgenic, but not in Europe, apparently. Mm. All right. Now, since we were on plant <clears throat> viruses, I found a link to an article in The Scientist. And this is a topic we've talked about before. Olivier uh, Boinet and Patrice Donnier, Donoyer. Remember, they had been uh, accused of some in inappropriate practices. We talked about this before. In and terms of their data handling. In terms data of data, data and yeah. yeah. So they have been penalized by the CNRS in France. Two scientists who have worked at the NCSR in France and are known for their research on how RNA interference helps certain plants fight off viral invaders are being punished by the Institution for Scientific Misconduct. Olivier Voinet, already banned temporarily from receiving funding from the Swiss government, received an official reprimand while his collaborator will be demoted. Now, an official reprimand? <laughs> what, we what? are very, very angry with you. And he has That's only right. temporary banned from <coughs> receiving yes. funding. You do something wrong and you get temporary. Okay. And the collaborator is going to be demoted, which seems worse, I guess. Well, anyway, if you're interested in this story, there you go. Mm -hmm. Dixon. Mm. Bob writes, I recently listened to TWIV 512 when Ann Simon joined the panel for a very interesting discussion of a couple of devastating plant viruses. Unless I did not understand her later in the podcast, I believe she was arguing the benefits of GMO crops so as to allow the targeted use of certain pesticides. I wonder what your reaction is to the recent study published in PNAS, glyphosate perturbs the gut microbiota of honeybees. Yes, very interesting. We're going to actually cover this story on TWIM next week. So my question is, yes, plant. I think Anne did say that. She said that you can engineer crops to be resistant, and then you could use glyphosate. Is it glyphosate or glyphosate? I would say glyphosate. Because Anne said glyphosate or glyphosate. She said glyphosate, yeah. And you said glyphosate. You I said glyphosate, glyphosate. That's what I say. I'm going with the plant biologist pronunciation. Of okay. Glyphosate. I've heard it pronounced by Monsanto employees. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> well, of course, that's always a problem. You know, the, you know, you got to look at other organisms, right? You never know. What they don't. Doing. They don't. They just look at the crop they're trying <laughs> to save. I thought Monsanto employees pronounced it Roundup. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They, they do. do. I'm sorry. I take it all back. You're absolutely right. <laughs> all right. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Niraj writes, Dear Twivers, it was great listening to and welcoming a dedicated plant virologist to the podcast. I had a lot of fun listening to the numerous anecdotes that Dr. Simon had about plant virus biology and current fun uh, the current funding situation for scientists in that field. With limited funding and kudos to NSF, I can only imagine how hard it must be to stay focused and motivated to pursue something that is so important from both scientific and especially economic standpoints, given how debilitating plant viruses can be towards crop production. And following up on the discussion about Monsanto and GMO, I recently came across this article on the side effects of using glyphosate in the honeybee population. And this is uh, the same. It's a link to a news summary of the same paper. 
Um, given that overall honeybee populations have taken an absolute beating in the last few years and the huge impact it has had on the pollination efficiency, this article throws some light onto the why that might have been the case. And finally, not to sound too pedantic, but just factual, <laughs> I wanted to correct something Dr. DePommier mentioned toward the end of the episode 512. He claimed Albert Einstein received a Nobel Prize for the diffusion theory, but I would most humbly like to state that even though he could have, it wasn't the discovery for which he received the Nobel Prize. In fact, this was his thesis work which on first submission was outright rejected. <laughs> he actually received the prize for his work on the photoelectric effect. So to set things in order, and provides a link, to set things in order, I just wanted to update that. Overall, I'm far more well-informed about the diverse world of virology due, the, due to the tireless efforts and tutelage of the TWIV team. And for that, I would like to sincerely thank each one of you. We as scientists have a moral obligation to be objective about the data and subjective about the science. Thanks for TWIVing, Niraj. And uh, Niraj, of course, is our friend at Sutravax. Uh, I just I want to mention that the the bee story is a little more nuanced than just honeybees are dying. Um, we're not going to run out of honeybees any sooner than we're going to run out of cows. These are these are a domestic species that's widely propagated and transported all over the place, and that's not really <laughs> the concern with any of these things, as far as I know, um, at least not by people. The bigger concern is that the bees that are not commercially maintained, all the solitary bees and bumblebees and all these others that are critical for pollinating a lot of the wild plants are possibly in danger from a variety of insults. Mm. Um, yes. There was the colony collapse was the issue with honeybees, but that was primarily infecting industrial hives. And um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, there, there's a lot going on with that issue. It's not the honeybee apocalypse. Yeah, and also this paper, while they show that glyphosate does perturb the gut microbiota, we don't know the... Is it a does bad that mean? perturbing? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Like, we don't know. Yeah, that's right. I, we, will, we will have a... I have met in my travel several honeybee scientists, and we will yeah. have them... Oh, good. ...who work nice. on viruses and honeybees. And they we can have get a, the latest buzz from them. We can get the latest buzz from oh, them. Hard. Exactly. But, uh, Kathy, yes. Some yeah, so I had a little follow-up. Because uh, when I was listening to TWIV 512, I was talking out loud to it at several points. <laughs> so uh, you were talking about how to pronounce sumoelation or sumoelation or whatever. I've mostly heard it as four syllables, sumoelation, where the Y and that syllable are silent. But uh, it came up several times at the International Adenovirus Meeting because E1B mm -hmm. is simulated and... Uh, E4 or 3 acts to simulate other things. And so uh, I just heard a lot of that. And then when uh, there was a discussion about what does in vitro mean versus in vivo versus either in animo or in plantae. And that's been something that I've been dealing with for years. And then, in fact, at the adenovirus meeting, the same thing came up where some people think in vitro means, you know, cell free in a test tube and mm. in vivo means in cell culture. <laughs> and then there are those of us that think in vitro means in cell culture and in vivo means in animals. So you just always have to define what it is you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. It's like in our textbook, we make a definition. And so it's consistent throughout that. But yeah, yeah. I've never used an animo, but it's a good way to solve the issues. So now you have three. Mm -hmm. So obviously the plant people do in plant day. Of course, if you're dyslectic, it's an, an amino, and that's an yeah, amino right. acid, and that's going to be tough. So I've heard people, <laughs> so you would say don't pronounce the Y, sumilation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. I guess I've heard people, it. and I've heard people say sumoilation as well, and I simply don't use the word enough. <laughs> I don't work on it, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, before we talk about a paper, I thought we would talk, chat a bit about this year's Nobel Prizes. This was Nobel Week. Sure was. And as usual, Dix and I have been skipped over. How could they do that again? <laughs> Always, every year. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, but, and before we talk about the Nobels, I was at Stanford and I gave a talk yesterday and Andy Fire came to my seminar who oh. won a Nobel in 2006 for RNA interference. And I knew Andy as a graduate student <laughs> in Phil Sharp's lab when I was a postdoc there. And this guy running around with a lab coat, his hair was always disheveled, <laughs> forgetting things. And he'd get a Nobel Prize in his 40s. Amazing. Anyway, he came up and said hello. And then later someone told me he doesn't put his Nobel on his CV because he doesn't want to be judged for that. Really? He wants to be judged by his science. Yes. That's Isn't hard. that awesome? It is. 
cool. Wow. But everyone will know anyway, right? Yes. I guess, I guess. It's the kind of thing where... <laughs> It's so not Dixon, every- if you got a Nobel, would you put it on your CV? <laughs> no, but I would be driving a Bentley. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> I think it changes people, probably. A little. Oh, you, there's he, a play on Broadway, by the way, starring, oh, um, I'll think of her name in a minute, but it's about a wife married to a scientist who wins the Nobel Prize and how that oh, yeah, upsets their about. life. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a movie that's called The Wife. There is a movie called The Wife with uh, Glenn Close in it. That is a movie? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a Broadway play. I'm sorry. I, no. I bought tickets to it, Dixon, on your recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> what well, am I going to see? You know, God only knows. <laughs> Maybe that's the name. I of bet it. Andy's life wasn't too affected. He tries not to. But, I mean, others, you know. Anyway, I'll never know, so that's fine. Anyway, to this, so we have, uh, let's go through a few of these. Physiology or medicine this year. James Allison and Tasuku Honjo for their discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. Hmm. And this is an immunology field. That's really cool. So we're going to actually cover this in detail on immune in a few episodes. Sounds good. But I think um, one of the things I like is Allison in this scientist article, which we'll link to, says, I didn't set out to study cancer, but to understand the biology of T cells, and you know this often happens, right? Sure. This uh, you you start doing something because it's interesting, uh, and uh, you end up getting something else rather than going after cancer. You know, well, we always talk about that. So Allison worked on a T cell protein called CTLA four, which is one of these breaks which inhibits T cell killing of other cells, tumor cells, or virus infected cells, and. He showed in the in the nineties that an antibody against a protein can restore T cell function, and he was looking at cancer. And others were interested in terms of um, um, autoimmune diseases, but he looked at cancer, and uh, he found that in fact in mice, antibodies against this program would reduce tumors. And the, the interesting thing is now this is huge. This is called checkpoint immunotherapy now. Right. And it's huge, but he said it took him, I thought everybody would jump at it, but it took him two years to get companies interested in in doing and helping with clinical trials. So he, 2003, he tested an antibody in 14 patients with melanoma, and it regressed in three of them. And But he kept going, and this is great. They submitted a paper. They got a review that said, it is well known that immunotherapy only works in mice. <laughs> What a typical <laughs> negative review that to yes. get only works. And how would you know that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. But he kept going. And that's another quality that's important to be persistent. Sure. And nowadays, these are used, these antibodies. The first one was approved, FDA approved in 2011. Ipilimumab. Ipilimumab for late stage melanoma. Save Jimmy Carter's life, right? I don't know if it was this one or the other one, which is, of course, PD-1, which for which Hanjo hmm. got the Nobel Prize. Either or. The girl from Ipilimumab. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's right. good. So Hanjo studied PD-1 um, and also found that it was a checkpoint cell surface receptor for T cells. And they showed that, in fact, there's a ligand that binds this program, PDL. One light, PDL1, and uh, can put breaks on the cells. So you can uh, take antibodies to either the ligand or the receptor and activate the T cells and make them kill tumors. So PDL is a program death. What does the L stand for? Ligand. Like, I'm sorry. Or ligand. Which one is it? <laughs> ligand. That's right. <laughs> I'm Why nervous. Whenever I talk now, I'm very nervous. <laughs> or, ner- or nervose. <laughs> 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 yes, ligand, ligand, <laughs> ligand. Wait, what do I say? I think I, I say ligand. ligand, yeah. Ligand. So both of these individuals working on similar things, you know, cell surface proteins of T cells that are right. kind of breaks on their activity because you have to regulate, you can't have immune activities going wild, you have to right. break them. And right. So the idea is if you can take these breaks off of T cells, they'll kill tumor cells. And in fact, it works. And so PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab, that's for melanoma as well. And they're, they're being used together now 
these antibodies against both are being used together. And of course, the CAR T-cell therapy is a different approach, but they are being supplemented with these antibodies as well. So they've really changed the face of uh, immunotherapy. It's quite impressive. Yeah. And Allison used to be here in New York City for a time. Mm. He was at Sloan Kettering. Mm. Um, but he is now at, in Texas. So that's one. That's the medicine prize. That's pretty cool. Yes. Uh, and then chemistry. Half of the prize goes to Francis Arnold for the directed evolution of enzymes, and the other half jointly to George Smith and Sir Gregory Winter for phage display of peptides and antibodies. I was just reading about Fred Sanger. You know, he got two Nobel Prizes, and they wanted to knight him. And he says, no, I don't want to be called sir. <laughs> so he turned it down. He was afraid of swords. <laughs> So what does a directed evolution mean? Well, we'll tell you. So this is very cool. Francis Arnold has been <coughs> pioneering this very cool thing. Let's say you have an enzyme that binds a substrate and makes something. Let's say you want to improve on it. Improve on it. So she took DNA encoding the enzyme and mutagenized it and then devised a way to select for better enzymes. I think the earliest thing she did was to... Um, alter an enzyme, and the assay was the, the size of clearing on a plate of the substrate. So you could pick in bacteria bigger clearing and that's the better working enzyme. You keep doing that over and over again. And uh, so you can get enzymes that are really much better than the original I one. I see. You could also uh, make enzymes that work under weird conditions right. or that can't make products or, or that have substrates that you didn't start with, but you could evolve it to fit that. Mm. You can also uh, evolve proteins that bind to it. So you don't have to restrict this to enzymes. It could be binding proteins, transcription proteins, for example, antibodies. So starting with the original idea, it has really uh, blown up. It's a really, really clever technique because you're, you're just, you take a... Um you take some function that you want to improve, and you, as long as you have an assay for it that you can score the improvement yeah. of, then you mutagenize and you select, and you mutagenize and you select, and you, you go through this, and you will select progressively better. I mean, the same way biology does it. Yeah. So but that, you're doing it in yeah. a laboratory to build a better enzyme you or to build a better— up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So the, uh, her first one was hydrolysis of casein. 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 <laughs> Casein. Casein. <laughs> and the, the enzyme makes halos on agar plates, so she simply looked for bigger halos, right? And that right. was an easy, nice, so you make a nice assay and you can do it. So the, the, these, uh, these summaries at the Nobel website are wonderful. There's lay summaries and there's science summaries, and they, they give you seminal papers, and you can really read all about it. It's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. can imagine, they put a lot of work into these. Right, so that's uh, Frances Arnold, uh, and she may, to our knowledge, yeah. be the first uh, Nobel Prize winner on Twitter. We're not sure about that, but at least Stephanie uh, Langle tweeted that now there's someone on Twitter who's won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> it's just strange that there wouldn't be any others, right? Well, there might be, but yeah. Who? How would you know unless they answered, right? Right. And they're probably not or, following Stephanie. Well, you so. could. You could. Uh, probably do this programmatically by taking a list of all Nobel laureates and, and uh, searching Twitter, screening it against uh, Twitter accounts. I don't right. think Stephanie's doing that because she's defending in a couple of weeks. Right. I <laughs> hope she's, I hope she's not doing that then. No. All, right. all right. So that's, um, that's very cool. And, and she has, this document has lots of other activities. For example, she changed the activity of cytochrome P450 to catalyze a set of reactions for which no enzyme was previously available. Where does she work, by the way? Caltech. Caltech. Wonderful right. place. All right. Oh, absolutely. They probably have a bunch of other Nobel laureates as well. Mm -hmm. That's and she she was in Texas when she got the phone call uh, to give a lecture, and she canceled her lecture and flew back to Caltech for the press conference and so forth. Huh. So Presumably, she promised the people in Texas that she'll come back. I don't know. <laughs> oh, so this is a cool, there are actually a whole list of applications, but one of them I thought was cool. Carbon silicon bonds are common in human made chemicals, but not in biology. So there are not a lot of enzymes that can break them so we can make them. 
right. with this mm-hmm. uh, technique. Right. I know a Nobel laureate, by the way, who received the notification in the morning before his class. Is this my, uh, the guy here? No, no. It was somebody else at Rockefeller. And they refused to cancel the class. They said, why should I cancel my class just for a press release? I'm going to go to class and give my lecture, and then I'll okay. be there. So he refused to buckle under the uh, mm-hmm. the uh, pressure from the common, you know, the popular press. Is sure. So George Smith uh, got the prize for uh, phage display. Wow. Yeah. Right. Uh, George Smith and Gregory Winter. That's George good Smith. That's good. So stuff. phage display is you take these filamentous bacteriophages and you insert a gene into their genome. So now it's displayed on the surface of the particle. Right. So. The, the so the the description here, uh, yeah, this is fine. The DNA is put in the genome, and then the the protein is displayed on the surface of the the phage, and then you could you could take those phages and screen them against whatever you're looking for. Now you have the gene, you put it into. You put in it in, if you want to find something that will bind the protein you stick in the phage, yeah. you can use that. Or if you have an antibody on the surface. Of the phage, and people did that eventually. So they started with proteins and showed that they can interact with targets, um, and showed that you could you could so search it, for it's different. A, it's a way of screening a CD li- to CDNA. Li- sure, you could. You could pick out something that binds from a library, or you could take something that binds and improve it using the previous methodology. Right, Directed so they go together yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, and eventually, people, um, you could. Um, find the epitopes rep- recognized by antibodies, right. right? So even if you can't right. put an antibody on the phage, if you put a, a library of epitopes on the phage and you have the antibody stuck on a surface, you could then find the epitope. Um, so you need libraries of peptides. Eventually, people figured out, George, Greg Winter, Sir Winter, was the first to put an antibody. I think it's Sir, Sir Gregory. Sir Gregory Winter. What did I say? You Gre- said Sir Winter. I, uh, yes, you're not I, supposed I think, to say. I, I'm not certain of this, but I, I think it's the first name is Sir is, Gregory. Is the, you're yeah. absolutely right, and I was called okay. out for that once on another uh, podcast. Really? Yes, by someone in England who knows all about this. Yes, he said, uh, you don't call them Sir Gregory Winter. It's Sir. They Gregory. are never going to make you Sir Vincent. Never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's <laughs> we have no more worries about that. That's for sure. <laughs> so he he was able to put a, a single chain antibody on the surface of these phages, and eventually people got. FAB fragments, so two, two arms up. And of course, when you put antibodies on, you can imagine all sorts of sure. experiments uh, with uh, the epitopes. And now you can use this to make fully human antibodies without having to first make a mouse monoclonal and then humanize it. And it's in fact, has been used to develop therapeutic antibodies, which are being used in people. You could go back to the cancer treatments and uh, connect those. Exactly, exactly. You can use those. So, you know, what's interesting uh, is that humanization of mouse monoclonal antibodies was developed many years ago by Sherry Morrison here at Columbia. She has a patent on it. Really? And now you don't have to pay that patent, but you have to pay a new one for, oh. for the phage display. So you know what I think it we ought to do? one to another. We ought to give a Nobel Prize for someone who humanizes politicians. <laughs> It may not be possible. I think perhaps you're right. <laughs> like, you know, scientists, we don't like to say things like it's not possible. Yeah, right. But it may not be. Yeah. Uh, because the fact that you have to please so many people, right, makes <laughs> exactly. it very different. Anyway, so those are the two, uh, the three, and they kind of all relate to one another, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And lots of people use them. First fully approved, first approved uh, therapeutic antibody using phage display was adalimumab. Approved in 2002. It's an antibody against TNF alpha. It's used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. You see it on television. You can see that ad on television. <laughs> Ask your doctor about yes. the purple pill and this one too. I've seen this one on TV. Already. Made with phage display technology. Exactly. They don't add that. No, the they end, don't. Because no one cares. <laughs> they do not. Right? They well, don't. no, they, they've got to compress the entire set of claims for the ad into about five seconds so they can spend the additional 55 seconds describing all the horrible the things that effects, can happen to right. you. <laughs> <laughs> if I sit there listening to these things, I yell out to my wife, I'll take two of those. <laughs> they, don't, they don't speak as quickly as the financial ads, though, right? No, that's true. Or the car ads. The car ads are even worse. <laughs> Because they have all these conditions in which right. they have to sell them, and it's crazy, right? Kathy, you want to tell us about some others? Sure. So uh, the Nobel Prize in physics resulted in only the third woman to get a physics Nobel Prize, 
Marie Curie got it in 1903 for uh, co-discovering radiation. Maria Geppert Mayer in 1963 for nuclear structure. And now Donna Strickland, uh, along with uh, Gerard Moreau, won it uh, for high-intensity ultra-short optical pulses. Mm. And this gets used in uh, LASIK surgery and a number of other things. Mm -hmm. And then the other person uh, to win the physics prize this year is Arthur Ashkin, 96, the oldest person to win a Nobel for optical tweezers. And uh, so there's several press releases about this. Um, the the uh, Donna Strickland was kind of surprised that she was only the third one. And <laughs> there's been a big gap from 1963 till now. Um, and there was a, a University of Michigan press release because Moreau was uh, at U of M for part of the time. And now CNN has an article describing how a sort of controversial 2010 video has resurfaced uh, about trying, it looks like it's trying to get children interested in physics, but it has some scant scantily clothed women and um, so on. So uh, there is that. Mm -hmm. So that's the physics prize. And uh, I put in those two same kind of links to the Nobel Prize page, the popular science uh, article and the advanced physics write-up for those. And then today, of course, the Peace Prize was announced. Mm -hmm. And that was shared between two people, only the 17th woman ever to get the Peace Prize. She's an Iraqi survivor and activist. And, it was sh and her name is Nadia Murad, shared with Dennis Mukwege, Mukwege um, a gynecologist from the uh, DR Congo uh, who treated thousands of affected women and girls. And oh, I forgot to say, the whole thing is for their work to end rape and sexual violence as weapons of war. Right. So um, that's uh, pretty cool. So I wanted to highlight that there were several women this year, uh, I guess three if I count it right. And um, I was thinking to myself that if all the prizes in the next X number of years were all to women, we would still never get to. <laughs> and and um, that reminds me of the comment that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is quoted as saying, and I think it was in the RBG documentary where someone asks, asked her, you know, what would be the ideal number of women on the Supreme Court? And she says, nine. Nine. And if, if people <laughs> raise their eyebrows or, you know, say, but, 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 and she said, well, for hundreds of years, right. there were nine men, you know, so probably well, that's never going to happen either. There were nine men. And, right. You know. <laughs> it's probably never going to happen, but Although there you go. It may not be better. No. Because as we see that, uh, you know, yeah. stuff it's, happens. How long have they been giving out the Peace uh, Prize, by the way? I think since the beginning. Really? I think that was in Nobel's will, yeah. Yeah, I think that was actually uh, the the inventor of um okay. of you know, smokeless gunpowder decided to come up with a prize for peace and exactly. made his fortune out of farms <laughs> manufacturing and yeah. Then, yeah. So we have talked before about Arturo Casadevall and Ferrick Fang's idea that prizes are not good for science, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, because it focuses mm. everything on a few people. And in one of these press releases, the uh, the winner, I think it was Allison, said, you know, or maybe Hanjo said, I, I didn't really do anything. I just built upon what was done. And that's always the case, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and I was just thinking, if you took all the money for all the prizes in the world and just funded some R01s, that might be better. <laughs> but that's never going to happen. No. So no. we proceed the way it is. All right, now we have a very cool paper, which has a virus word in the title, but is not really about viruses directly. Nevertheless, I thought it was very cool and involves pathways that are important for virus infections. And I just thought... It was for a, for a nature letter, which are often very difficult to read because there's so much packed into a small space. It was not bad, and there are a lot of experiments in here. I thought it was pretty good. So the title is Mitochondrial Double-Stranded RNA Triggers Antiviral Signaling in Humans. And we have a sole first author and two co-second authors. Yeah, is that right? the first time we've had that? I have not seen that. I think yeah. we've done it at another podcast. Okay. 
Uh, I mean, most of the papers I read, I don't pay that close attention to the yeah. author order. Well, but, you know, I started to because Kathy would say I got it wrong. So right. now I pay attention. Now I pay attention. I give credit right, so, where so the credit first is author on this you can is, still yes, get it I wrong. understand, but I didn't look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> first, first author on this is Ashish Deer. The co-second authors are Sam Dutta Deer and Lukasz Borowski. And then senior author is Nicholas Proudfoot. Nicholas Proudfoot, I've known that name for a very long time since I was a Me graduate too. student, Me right? Too. It's a distinctive yeah. name. Yes, yeah. he's 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 proud of his shoes, yeah. for sure. <laughs> and the group is from a whole bunch of different places. Uh, University of Oxford, Polish Academy of Sciences, University of Warsaw, UCLA, uh, Institut Imagine in Paris, CNRS, um, or INSERM, not CNRS, uh, Institut Pasteur, and University of Manchester, UK. I think I got them all. Oh, University of Edinburgh. So this is all about mitochondria, which I've been more and more interested in lately. Very interesting stuff. As I broaden my thoughts beyond nucleotide 453. <laughs> you know, I spent many years studying one base in the polio genome. <laughs> <laughs> so mitochondria, of that course. That does explain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> mitochondria are... Some people just can't get off 453rd base. <laughs> I guess not. Our mitochondria are... Former bacteria, which invaded cells once, right? In evolution, we think. Terrible. And they became endosymbionts uh, and they provide energy for cells and were very important in the evolution of eukaryotes. Uh, but they they still basically have what looks like a bacterial genome. It's very small, but it's circular, double stranded DNA. Right. And both strands are transcribed and that can give you double stranded RNA. And if that got in the cytoplasm of the cell, would be a problem because it would be recognized by innate immune sensors like MDA5 and others, stimulate interferon production, and interferon, while it's, it's a nice antiviral protein, it, is, it has its problems. It has side effects. Ask anyone who's received interferon therapy. Mm. So viruses, many viruses make double-stranded RNA during infection. Then some cases, that's how it's sensed. You know, in the old days, when these sensors were first discovered, they, we said, ah, oh, this is beautiful. There's no double-stranded RNA in cells, so this is a perfect way to detect an invader. Well, guess what? <laughs> there is double-stranded <laughs> RNA in cells, and this mitochondria is one source of it, as we will see. There are other sources, but coolly, cells have evolved ways to deal with that. Why didn't we think of that? And that's what this paper is about. So, by the way, this will come up later. Another source of double-stranded RNA in cells is transcription of a, a series of repeated sequences in our nuclear genome called ALU sequences. All right, these are... I thought they were ALU sequences. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they are, but they played an early important role in my career because in the early days of cloning, you could use... An, a, an ALU sequence is found about once every 5,000 bases in the genome. And early on, someone cloned this sequence, which, by the way, is a retrotransposon, or it's actually a, an, a line or sign element that's multiplied many times in the genome. And you could use that to pull out genes. We used it to pull out the poliovirus receptor. Mm. ALU, what's the bacterium after? ALU is a restriction enzyme, ALU1. And I don't remember the, the uh, bacteria that it was isolated from, but maybe if we pronounce that, of course, B BGL1 is bagel1, and that doesn't make sense either, right? Right. Do you say bagel or bigel? <laughs> I say if bagel. I'm, if I'm hungry, I say bagel. <laughs> yeah, the first person who started saying bagel was uh, Dan Nathans, and he said, yeah, I'm from New York. I call yeah, exactly, it bagel. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> right Double-stranded. So ALU sequences are transcribed, and they form extensive double-stranded transcripts. And they, so you would think, oh, what's going to happen to them when they get in the cytoplasm? Well, there's an enzyme in cells called ADAR1, adenosine deaminase, and it changes A's to I's, and that prevents formation of double-stranded RNA. By the way, it's Arthrobacter luteus. Arthrobacter oh. luteus. Ah. So it's alu. 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 <laughs> and the only reason I know about ADAR is because we just hired someone who works on it. Hmm. And so I've gotten interested in things that prevent double-stranded uh, RNA formation in cells. Is that an editing uh, thing that you just described? Um, so ADAR? Yeah. ADAR, yeah. it edits A's to I's. Yeah, yeah it okay. changes the A to I. Sure, you could call that editing. Okay. Now, Alan may 
object because his editing is different. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, do, I don't just change all the A's to us. <laughs> <laughs> but you do uh, cross your T's, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So this starts with an antibody. D- Dixon came in this morning. He goes, what's J2? <laughs> said, what is it? It's an antibody to <laughs> double-stranded RNA, um, which you could use to stain cells. And they see uh, cytoplasmic fluorescence in cells infected with a virus, a coronavirus called the EMCV, which is correct because the coronaviruses like polio and EMCV, they produce double-stranded RNA, and you could pick that up in the cytoplasm with this antibody. But then in uninfected cells, they also saw weak cytoplasmic fluorescence. And if you treat the cells with a double-stranded RNA ribonuclease, it goes away. So I bet this whole study arose from a control. What do you think? Mm, Is it possible? Yeah. So there's some double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm. So the next the next experiment is just great. They take this antibody, they immunoprecipitate the RNA, right. and they sequence it, which you couldn't do five years ago. And 99% of the reads are my, from the mitochondrial genome. So this is mitochondrial double-stranded RNA, and it's from both strands, and so that's why it, it's mm. double-stranded. Isn't that cool? Yes. Um, yeah, so we wouldn't have been able to do that years ago and, and known that it had come from the mitochondria. They can all, <laughs> here's another cool experiment, which I didn't know you could deplete mitochondria from cells with yeah. a viral protein. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> a herpes simplex type 1 viral protein or an enzyme, uracil and glycosylase, apparently will deplete mitochondria, and that gets rid of this uh, fluorescent signal. So I think it has to do with... DNA damage that there's somehow there's mm-hmm. so much DNA damage that you that you lose the DNA genome. I kind of went down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out how those work, and um, that was that's my take home. But I we might should, be wrong. We should probably revisit that one day. Yeah, yeah. All right. So the idea here is that so the, there is mitochondrial double strand RNA, but there's not a lot in the cytoplasm. You know, it's a faint signal. So they said, what, what's going on? Why isn't it in the cytoplasm? So there are a couple of genes previously known to be involved in um, keeping, uh, is it DNA out of the cytoplasm? I don't remember what the lead well, was I here. I think it's RNA. Is it's it RNA? the RNA degradosome. Now, the RNA degradosome, yes, for regulating. So one of them is called SUV3, which is a mitochondrial RNA helicase. So that would unwind double-stranded Right. RNA. And then PNPase, polynucleotide phosphorylase, which apparently is also unwinding, right? And there, are these, as Kathy said, these are involved in degradation of uh, mitochondrial RNAs. So they knock down uh, the, the RNA for either one with siRNA. And when you do that, you decrease, uh, you increase the amount of double-stranded RNA in the mitochondria. And they did a nice experiment to show that the uh, without these proteins, you extend the half-life of the double-stranded RNA from 30 minutes to three hours. So normally it, it turns over more quickly, and if you inhibit these uh, one of these two uh, proteins, um, it, it makes the RNA last longer. They also have a mutant of an altered SUV3, so that's the helicase that inactivates the helicase, and it also is a dominant negative mutant, which is beautiful because you could put it in cells and it will poison all the other SUV3s that are there. Right. And when they do that, you also get double-stranded RNA accumulation and it also gets longer, longer double-stranded RNAs. Mm. When uh, you look up the word degradosome, which I did, mm. uh, you first come up with the fact that it comes from bacterial nomenclature. It's how RNAs are degraded in bacteria through it. Mm-hmm. structure called the degradosome. So this is carrying that parallel okay. into the okay. descendants of the endosymbiotic bacteria hmm. that are the mitochondria. How many genes again does the mitochondria encode? Mm. Oh. 13 oh. or something like that? No, it's it's more than that. There's a, I think there's like 22 messenger RNAs and, I mean, tRNAs and, um, yeah, I forget. Uh, but I was looking up various things about mitochondria 
it encodes uh, thirty seven has thirty seven genes, two two yeah. ribosomal 30, RNAs, twenty two oh, okay. tRNAs, and thirteen proteins. Because I know the chloroplast has a lot more than that. I think they're up to around seventy or something like that. Mm. Do mm-hmm. they assume that that's from a bacteria also? Yeah, endosymbiont. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah blue green yeah. algae, cyanobacteria. Sorry, I used the old term. I'm sorry, everyone. Hey, so plants, <laughs> plants have both of them, though. Have both, yep. yeah. They, they have mitochondria mm-hmm. and chloroplasts. They do. They so do. that's. Mm-hmm. So, so were there two, event, two <laughs> events that integrated these, or were this, was there one and the mitochondria evolved from the chloroplast or vice versa? I was going to say, what are we, chop liver animals? They don't get the benefit of photosynthesis? I, the mitochondria <laughs> is thought to be one, one time thing. Yeah. One, event. one event. And I don't know about the plants. Can you imagine a world where all the animals, like just like ours, except they're all photosynthetic? Oh, I was reading something about that. You don't have enough surface activity. I was, yeah. The animal mm-hmm. surface activity would not be enough. Well, we're very slow. <laughs> no, but if you think of trees, the, all those leaves have lots of surface. Of course, act, we'd have to we'd have to have a whole lot of spread out. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't well, they look, they look different. They're like, and that's meaty. probably <laughs> why it didn't uh, work, right? I guess. Because uh, I guess. there's not enough surface. Yeah. Except that uh, all of the coral polyps are photosynthetic because they have zooxanthellae and so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit different. Well, you can't have a lion, a photosynthetic lion, which just be no. sleeping all day. <laughs> Well, they kind of do right. anyway. But exactly. it oh, they do. <laughs> Except for one little brief period <laughs> when they hunt, <laughs> scares the hell out of everybody. So, so far we had this. We have this um, SUV three mutant. They have an altered PNPase. Now, this protein has two activities: it's an exonucleases, and it's also it, it affects uh, export or import into the cytoplasm. It depends on your perspective, right? And they deplete, so the experiment is they deplete PNPase, and then they put back in the altered PNPase, which is resistant to siRNA, otherwise it would be degraded by it. And so now we have a PNPase, which only affects exonuclease activity, and this altered protein does not suppress the increase in double-stranded RNA. So both... Uh, the unwinding activity of SUV3 and the exo of PNPase are involved in this uh, turnover of double-stranded RNA in the mitochondrion, okay? Two proteins, two, two mechanisms. And then, of course, as you might suspect, putting this double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm does turn on interferon. They actually look at that. You see a big induction of interferon and interferon-stimulated genes when you deplete only PNPase, but not SUV3. I, every time I say SUV, I think of a car. A really That's right, car. exactly right. <laughs> so, again, the, the sensors of double-stranded RNA are cytosolic or cytoplasmic. If you inhibit PNPase, you see a big induction of uh, interferon. But if you inhibit SUV3, you don't see this. That's weird, right? We're going to figure it that is. out. We're going to figure that out in a moment. Another cool experiment, you extract double-stranded RNA from the mitochondria. You've turned it up way to high levels by depleting these one of these two proteins. You transfect it into HeLa cells, you get interferon induction. That's kind of cool. It just shows that mitochondrial double-stranded RNA can induce interferon. I think the key experiment here is they do transmission electron microscopy with immunogold-labeled J2. J2 Dixon is an antibody against you know, double-stranded RNA. Okay, fine. And they can see that when they deplete SUV3, the double-stranded RNA is only in the mitochondria. Right. When they deplete PNPase, it's in the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. Mm. So somehow PNPase is involved not only in pulling apart the double-stranded RNA, but in keeping it in the mitochondria. Right. That really is a beautiful figure. So nice, so, yes. Yeah. Lovely. And this PNPase is in the mitochondrial in, intermembrane space and the matrix. So it's these two proteins, one, they both unwind or degrade the helix, and one of them keeps the double-stranded RNA in the mitochondria. So two preventable, preventive. Because there's actions. a lot of traffic between the cytoplasm and the mitochondria during normal biology, right? Are you asking or telling me? No, that was. A, <laughs> I hope that was a correct statement. You know, with you, Dixon, you got a record of about ninety percent. No, I'm pretty bad at this. Actually, I seem to remember though hearing from a mitochondriologist that the mitochondria and the and the host cell communicate quite a. a well, yes, yeah, but you in have fact, to- there's a, there's a lot of um, 
we mentioned the mitochondrial genes, but the, a lot of the structure of the mitochondria is made up from host genes. Yes. Right. So this is an unusual situation because they're trying to keep something from going out, but ordinarily lots of things go yeah, out. Yeah, something like right. double strand. So these, this enzyme PNPase is tasked with not letting it get yes, out. that's right. So how that happens, actually, we don't know. They will not resolve that. Right. But you, but I'm I'm worried because you do have to maintain the proton gradient, right? So these things are not completely permeable. Obviously, there have to be specific transporters, exactly. mitochondria, exactly. right? Exactly. They also have a mouse. Um, now it turns out that if you knock out PNPase gene, it's lethal. Yes, and that's right. You could probably guess why they make all well, this double stranded RNA makes too much interferon. But they have no virus infections. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't live to have one, right? So they have a mouse knockout with PMPAs knocked out only in the liver. And these mice can apparently grow How interesting. to a certain age. And they can see double-stranded RNA in liver sections be darn. and increased interferon. So this is a good experiment because it shows that uh, immunosuppression does not only happen in mice. No, that's the other th That's the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, that, that the... That the increase in double-stranded RNA doesn't only occur in uh, cultured cells. Yeah. Um, so, so this lethality, by the way, of the knockout of PNPase, they would make too much interferon. You would die of it. You would get inflammation. It's called a type 1 interferonopathy. Right. <laughs> yes. It's a nice word, isn't it? Do you remember, just as an aside here, I'm going to go back to something that I truly do remember. We reviewed um, trichomonas... Um, uh, trichomoniasis, right? Trichomonas yeah, vaginalis. Yeah. And it has a double-stranded RNA virus. It does. And the pathology from it is due to the reaction of the double-stranded RNA. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the double-stranded RNA is sensed by interferon. Yeah, and it you induces get more a pathology. huge inflammation. Yeah, because if you infect animals without the virus, the yep. pathology is lower. Correct. Now, what is the purpose of this? That's does it help the parasite? I do not know. Does it help the virus? I do not yeah. know. See, I notice I didn't say why. No, you didn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just trying to, you know, put two and two together and get five because, uh, you know, this is the same so, so, immune so mechanism. Dixon, we have <clears throat> cells, we have mice. What would you like to see next? Animal. A mouse is an animal. Well, a higher animal. I oh, think people. There's no hierarchy in biology. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking up this Nobel stuff today, and they said the lowly worm. I was looking up Andy Fire's Nobel. I think. And I said, how can any organism be lowly? I don't think that's fair. No, that's true. That's true. But mice have different sets of um, um, uh, innate immune sensors, no, no, don't they? No, no, of course. They're different. The toll-like receptors are different. You know, even the a rotifer is it's a very thing of beauty. It's a complex. Thing of don't say it's lowly. I never said mm -hmm. lowly. Do you guys agree with that, that there's no lowly organism? So what would I like to see next, you asked? <laughs> you say, I would say humans. That's the progression, yeah. right? Yeah. And in well, fact, there, there, are are, there are genetic defects. Yes, there are people yes. with mutations in the gene encoding P and PASE, and they have four patients. Wow. And the three of them make less protein. Wow. And one has an active site mutation. These patients all accumulate double-stranded RNA that co-localizes with mitochondria. It can also be found in the cytoplasm. These patients have upregulated interferon, interferon-stimulated genes, and they say to levels in the in one patient, I think, in the cerebrospinal fluid, to levels that you would get in viral meningitis, and they're not infected. So these patients have, in fact, one of the four died, I think, yeah. at one year of age. They have, they have type 1 interferonopathies because the, they have a change in the PMPase that allows double-stranded RNA to get into the cytoplasm. Does this suggest that it can be corrected? Totally, right? Now that we know what's wrong? Um, you could use yeah. CRISPR to do something? I mean, I don't... So I don't know what the important cell target would be, right? Yeah. But because you can't get... You can't put a gene in every cell in someone. No. But oh. So I don't know. That would, that would be important to find out where the, you'd have the to put patients it. that they looked at, uh, one died at age two years old, and then the others, we don't exactly have a lot to go on here because one they say alive at one year, another is alive at seven, another is alive at thirteen. Mm. Yeah. So we don't know. We don't know how these kids are going to do. Um, this is certainly not something good. No, I, I mean, I think the next paper will be to take the sequences of these patients, PNPases, and introduce them in cells and see what the phenotype right. is, right? 
I'm sure mm-hmm. that'll happen next. But sure, uh, the implication is that they have or will have interferonopathies. Right. Mm. Uh, but yeah, correcting it is in principle easy. You could you know give them a a lentivirus with the gene, but you, I don't know where you'd put it. Right. Right. Mm. I don't what cells you can't because as I said, you can't put it in all cells. Right. They also figure out what sensor is detecting this cytosolic double-stranded RNA, and so they, you know, we know a bunch of different sensors, so they just knock them down one by one. And it turns out it's MDA5, which is not surprising because we know that senses double-stranded RNA, at least in virus infections. They have a, a few experiments showing that the, the, the double-stranded RNA comes out of mitochondria through pores formed by two proteins, Bax and back, which are involved in apoptosis. And I don't know what that means because we, there's no connection with PMPase, which supposedly keeps right. the double strand RNA in the mitochondria. So that's kind of a side thing, but um, that's there. And then they, they go to ADAR1, which, which I mentioned way at the beginning. So they ask, does ADAR1 involved in somehow interfering with mitochondrial double-stranded RNA. So remember, ADR1 is a cytosolic enzyme that will take double-stranded RNA and change A to I. And so what they do is they deplete ADR1 and PNPase, right, together. So PNPase depletion puts the mitochondrial double-stranded RNA in the cytosol. And then they ask, does it worse if you also deplete ADR1 in terms of interferon induction? And it is. So they think if any, so basically if any double-stranded RNA leaks out of the mitochondria, then maybe ADAR will help to take care of it uh, and suppress innate responses. So you may be thinking type 1 interferonopathies, is kids have a mutation in PNPase. Ki- people with type 1 interferonopathies also can have mutations in ADAR1 or MDA5. And if you think about what we've just said, that makes perfect sense, right? Right. PMPase would let double-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm. Mutations in PMPase gene, uh, mutations in ADAR1 would not only not f- be able to reverse double-stranded mitochondrial RNA, but it would also not be able to deal with the ALU double-stranded RNAs. Right. And of course, MDA5 is the sensor. These mutations in the MDA5 gene in people with type 1 interferonopathies, make it hyperactive, make MDA5 signal without having much RNA around. So you can have a lot of problems living on this planet. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know? the take-home message. And the cool thing is, as we learn all this detail, we, fi- we begin to understand certain human diseases like this particular one. Yeah. So the, this here's the story. We have... A mitochondrial circular genome, we cannot prevent the production of double-stranded RNA because it has to be transcribed. So instead, we have two proteins that prevent it from getting into the cytosol. I think that's a cool solution, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. And um, actually, there was a virus in this paper, wasn't there? The EMCV. <laughs> right. It was, a, it was a control that started the whole thing off. And that's uh, that's the story. I, I just think it's very... Um, yeah, so the, the mitochondria. Cool story. It was this was a bacterial infection, and it still has to hide because it still has the hallmarks of an infection that will set off the cells' uh, interferon alarms. And so there's a system within the mitochondria to deal with that, and then the cell also has ADAR um, to potentially pick up a little bit of the slack. But you you need all these systems in place in order for this to keep holding together. I like that thought that the, the mitochondria still have to hide. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I found something interesting, and that is mm-hmm. that these patients with the uh, PNPase mutation mm-hmm. uh, had high interferon alpha levels in their cerebrospinal fluid. Right. They also had high levels of neopterin. So I had to look up what that is. Right. And it's a catalo- catabolic product of GTP. Mm. And It's synthesized by human macrophages upon stimulation with interferon gamma. And so it Hmm. is a marker for immune system activation. But, you know, when I first saw neopterin, I thought, "Mm, that sounds kind of like an antibiotic or something. Right. (laughs) Yes. yes. Geosporin. Ask your doctor about neopterin. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, Hmm. yeah, I had a lot of things to kind of look up in this paper. It was fun. 
So by the way, there are kids that have a lot of respiratory infections early in life, especially rhinovirus infections. They have a single amino acid change in MDA5 that prevents it from sensing the viral double-stranded RNA. So they get, they get infections over and over again. As we do more of these fundamental experiments, we learn more and more about how things are working. I think it's yeah. just so cool. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to do that. I thought this would be a cool paper. Plus, I really like mitochondria. I've been reading a lot about them lately, and they are so cool. A lot of cool things going on in them. And, you know, apoptosis, I think, originally involved to kill defective mitochondria. And did you know that mitochondria are only passed maternally? Yes, I did. But sperm have them. They're just shut off. All right. There you go. <laughs> See why I like mitochondria? They're just so interesting. All right. Let's do some letters. We have an, an, a letter from Anonymous. I knew that person. Who was... <laughs> I, 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 I it was about, written some Got a lot of bills from that person. <laughs> so this is about uh, teaching. So a while ago, we talked about um, how there might... Maybe there should be separate tracks for teaching and research in universities, right? Right. Right. Um, and so this writer had some feelings about that. This person has a, uh, a, a BS in physics and math and an MS in biology and another MS from an R01 driven school. Almost. It's soon to be MS. Soon to be MS. So, so uh, this writer says, I like the idea of separate tenure track for teaching depending on the institute and level being taught. Graduate courses, and to some degree, senior undergraduate coursework benefits immensely from having educators that are experts and up to date. These courses are generally supposed to be driven towards students that are soon to be moving in these fields. A, their work wiser research from their degrees in undergraduate programs, or the bulk of the teaching load, doesn't even go towards students in the field being taught. Right. So think science credit requirements for BS degrees, chemistry 101, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. or laying the foundation for future scientists in the field that includes critical thought, processing, and an understanding of the underlying work that is built up in our fields. While odd tidbits are sometimes only that, it helps enrich the understanding of the field. There are things that don't benefit greatly from the latest research being published on epigenetic modifications using DCAS9 fusion proteins, for example. Right. <laughs> you don't need all those details. So to me, you need to disconnect the idea of a good researcher and a good educator. They are not mutually exclusive, but unfortunately don't seem to correlate well in the current environment of how we are training new PhDs. This, I believe, can be tied to how most labs turn PhDs into just a form of slave labor. You have a cheap source that you're generally guaranteed to be around for four to five years, and these students can, if need be, find their own funding so they don't drain a budget as much as a dedicated technician. This is obviously And you can not, pay them a lot less. Right. This is obviously not everyone, but funding mechanisms do push having student training as a major component. I found excellent educators in the medical school, albeit so, they are few, tend to do well with R01 grants, as someone mentioned on TWIV 509. I also have found poor educators to the point I'm unsure if they even know how they still have jobs. Many of uh, my courses were typically me and three under, other students. These are undergraduate courses. That's small. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's a level of scrutiny hard to come by in a larger institution. Granted, we still have some educators, like my professor who wrote the book, and my calculus professor who used transparencies made 20 years ago, <laughs> but also had <laughs> professors that on statistics and thermodynamics that came in the course the first day and looked at the blackboard and immediately walked us out to find a room with more blackboards. <laughs> 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 Here, you wouldn't be able to find another room. I think in most places, they're all booked. Mm -hmm. My virology professor, who turned into my advisor, would take us over. Probably don't want to don't want to go too deeply into this part. This person wants to remain anonymous. Yeah, <laughs> would take us over to a neighboring school to listen to lectures. So there does need to be some balance. Both good professors to do some research. We had the fun. We had fun with the class because they cared, not because they were actively researching and publishing. What made them excellent educators? It also helped them do research. But the research itself didn't help. From what made them excellent educators? The opinion piece describes Einstein, Einstein, but the classic counterexample to this is Feynman. No one could call the king of the bongos anything short of a world-class physicist and a world-class educator, right? Uh, okay, this doesn't have to be included in this show here, right? So I'm right. not going to read it. 
is because it's a gripe, mm. uh, and, and that, but it, it wants advice for this situation. So I'm not, I can't give it because we're not reading it, right? Yeah. Well, it, okay, we can. I, I we think can. You just wanted to keep it anonymous, but would still be interested in advice for someone who's nearly done with a second master's degree and wants to figure out should they just stick it out or not. I right. see. No, almost done. So what's your advice for students getting put in these situations? I have an advisor with multiple R1s that supports me, a committee that supports me, collaborators that support me, but political infighting killed my degree and my career. Do I write a thesis or withdraw and wait for a program? Should I keep quiet? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do we think? What should, what should this person do? Do we have enough information? So do they want to t- uh, keep quiet? Was uh, Do they keep quiet about um, they feel that that they've been handled uh, in in a way that's not in accordance with their own with the graduate handbook at this school uh, or push for change. Uh, I would I would say there's never anything good that comes from being a whistleblower in most cases, at least for the individual. So you really want to think carefully. I, I don't want to discourage people from coming forward because it's a very important thing, but you, you want to think carefully before before taking on your university. Well, this individual is supported all around, right? Right. So fin- um, I think you should finish up. You've put so a lot is, of time. Well, this in, is right? this is somebody. So this um, is somebody who has had uh, success along the way, but is being kicked out of the program uh, by the by a qualifying, uh, I guess, a qualifying exam uh, process Maybe. or qualif- yeah. some sort of qualification process that um, they've they've decided that this person needs to go, um, and the writer obviously mm. feels that they're being wronged here. Um, and you know, quite probably from the description, I would say, yeah, this, this sounds like yeah. not very good treatment. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I'm I was trying to figure out that whether this second almost masters is because they're not, they've not gotten approval to go on for a PhD I, or maybe I'm reading yeah. too much into it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm having a little trouble figuring out exactly what the situation is, and not just because we're anonymizing it, but based on on what's Here. in the letter. Yeah. So I don't know so, what the what the options are that we're advising on. Right. Well, this is. Yeah, you're right. This person was is being kicked out of the program by a qualifying right. group in a different department. So he wants to know what to do. Right. I would do as much as you can to salvage what you've done there. Yeah. Right. Forget about yeah. exposing anything. It's never going to work, as Alan right. said. Right. Don't don't burn bridges. Just do what you can. And you, you know, you, you say you're not sure you can financially do that. Go somewhere else. Well, that's important, right? To see, yeah. maybe you can find a program that'll support you. But if you really want to do this, if you want to get your PhD and continue, you, you should try because otherwise, you'll always think back and say, "I didn't even try." Right. 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 Yeah, I would say at this point, you're probably looking at. Get what you can done, um, whatever, you know, if there's if there's an option to write a thesis or a final paper for this, go ahead and do that. So you have that completed work um, and move on to whatever position is going to keep paying the rent. Um, and maybe that's a research technician position for a little while or, or whatever. And um, and then go from there, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe apply to maybe apply to programs, PhD programs. And, uh, in that process, I think I would probably suggest being honest, but not, um, not diving too deeply into the grievance. Right. Not you know, say, or- went like write write the CV, went to this program, you know, ended at this date and now applying to mm-hmm. PhD programs. And when they ask, why did you leave there? Um, you can say that you felt, you felt it wasn't a good fit or you, that you, you know, your GPA wasn't high enough or that they, they, uh, the environment was not supportive in in the ways that you needed or something, you know, but you, you don't have to go into all the details and make it sound like you were, like you were a problem. Right. Okay. Just go to the University of Michigan. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Alan, can you take the next one? Yes, Adam writes, I suspect this popped up on Twix at some point, but in light of the recent discussion of sequence database mining on TWIF 509, it seems like a good time to bump the Research Parasite Awards. 
Uh, and this is fun. <laughs> this is a reference to something some some fusty senior investigator said a few years ago about um, people doing bioinformatic analyses and subsequent analyses on published data. Uh, that the people who collected those data originally were the originators of it, and these other people who come along and analyze it and find new information in it are just parasites. Bah humbug! Get off my lawn. Um, <laughs> I like parasites. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this is this is uh, the uh, thing awards. Is, these are awards for rigorous secondary analysis. Yeah, yeah. No, I read the that. The thing is, I, se- sequence is all about this now, right? Yes. The, the yeah. planarian virus we did was all about somebody right. finding right. in right. another that's sequence, right? right. That's right. right. That's so right. That's, yeah. right. that's the way it goes. I know. It's fine. And, and this is the point, you know. The, there it is. The science right. cannot all be done by no. one person, no. and that's it's right. a team effort, and. You know, you yeah, you collected these data, and that's great, and you did your first analysis of it, but you know you can't analyze all these terabytes and petabytes or no. whatever that you've got piled up there, and no. you put it in the database so other people can use it, and, and that's great. That's right. Petabytes. A lot of the research done at the School of Public Health over here is done on uh, meta-analysis of sure. gigantic data sets from, you know, um, the uh, Census Bureau of various countries. Uh, yeah. Crime records that <laughs> were recorded during the Second well, World War. In medicine, this is standard now. I've talked to a couple of researchers just recently who've done stuff with these big databases kept by health insurers mm-hmm. and by major yeah, medical centers. Yeah, that's right. That's and, right. And they, they mm-hmm. have ways of, um, instead of trying to anonymize the data, what they actually do is the researchers will submit their, their uh, formatted query and then the um, – the data holder, the insurance company or whatever, will will return the statistical answer to that query. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're not actually transferring any patient data. You're just saying, oh, this percentage of our of our insureds met these criteria. Yeah, yeah. Um, or whatever. So yeah, there's huge amounts of research being done this way, and it's sure. great stuff. And I and I applaud the Parasite Awards. Yeah, there you great. go. They should probably change those to something else, though, rather. <laughs> no, it's a great name. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, parasite implies harm, right, Dixon? It does, actually. We're not harming anything here. No, these are symbionts. These symbionts. are add-ons. <laughs> symbiont awards. They, they are. They're the symbiont awards. That's Dixon, right. can you take that? Again, anonymous writes, Dear Vincent and Co. Twivers. This is a different anonymous. It is. <clears throat> There's a lot of them. First, thank you for putting up this great podcast. As a regular TWIP listener, TWIP listener, I really like the new section by Dixon on his scientific heroes, talking about the life and achievements of the people after whom all these cute parasites are named. Wouldn't something similar be a good idea for TWIV, too? I would love to hear the stories of influential but little-known luminaries, such as Frederico Picorna, <laughs> Frederick Hanta, <laughs> I, I hope he's making these up, yes. Gina Polioma, and most importantly, Richard T. Norwalk from <laughs> Ohio, Yes, I take exception to that. I'm looking forward to many more great installments. Best regards. You cross Dixon. out his name and it's anonymous. Dixon, this person has been listening since the Norwalk days. He has. Of Ohio, he has. Connecticut. He right? has. <laughs> mm-hmm. He has. All right. So this is a great idea. I think we should do a hero. Yeah, I would agree. I, I and do. I had originally picked someone else, but Dixon said you have to pick the, the person who discovered the first virus. So that would be Adolf Meyer. A German agricultural chemist whose work on tobacco mosaic disease played an important role in the discovery of tobacco mosaic virus. And that is the first What virus, was the date on that? The discovery? Yeah. 1892. Wow. Is that correct? 1879? No. He, he was asked by Dutch farmers to study this disease affecting Tobacco, he published a paper in 1886 on the disease, which he called tobacco, mosaic the disease of tobacco, and he showed it could be transmitted using sap. Uh-huh. Filtration experiments were replicated by Ivanovsky in 1892 and Bayerink in 1898. It was Martinez Bayerink who first coined the term virus in 1898. Look at that. And who, so, who, who coined the term filterable agent? I don't know if it was anybody certain, need to coin it. No, I, well, I think it was a concept that rose because yeah. they would put, they would distinguish these from bacteria by, by yeah, filtering them. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So Adolf Meyer was uh, born in 19, 1843 in Oldenburg, Germany. Wow! Oh. And listen to this: he died on Christmas Day, nineteen forty-two, at the age of ninety-nine. 
Wow. Yeah. wow. Gee. All right, so we're going to do this, and the next time we have a female and then a male, and then we're going to alternate. Great. Because you know, Kathy, in Parasites, Dixon can't come up with any women heroes. Mm-hmm. We've tried very hard, and mm-hmm. um, he can't. The I closest can't. we got was Walter Reed's wife, who was awarded the first Walter Reed medal after he passed away, but she had never worked in the lab before. They just did it to honor her. No, we had one who was suggested by a listener who, remember, we're very early on. Well, there was a woman that worked on fleas in England, which we're we're going to honor. We're putting her in our book. Her last name is Rothschild. You just have to work harder, Dixon. Well. We're going to look harder. We will. Well, that's a good idea. I like that. So yeah. we it's our, vi- what did they call it? A uh, virology hero. Virology. I, I really um, like Evgenia polyoma. Not yes. bad. <laughs> so Dixon, those are fake, but yeah. they do have the virus names. You get it? <laughs> I, okay. Yes. Kathy, can you take the next one? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, oh, no. Where'd my... <laughs> I, I went know. off it to, to find famous women virologists <laughs> and famous female virologists. And when you go to the famous... Oh, it, never mind. It was, I thought it was a famous women virologist page, but instead it's just famous virologist because it was all men except for um, Francois, uh, the HIV person. Um, Francois, Paris, da, 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 you da, say. Da, right. And now I'm off of that page and I'm yeah, trying to get back to our document. Man. And I'm having a really hard time. Virology, it's kind of a short one here. You know, in contrast to parasitology, virology has a lot of famous women virologists. This is good. No problem. Right. Right. Okay. I am now back on the Google Doc. <laughs> Anthony writes, 90 iron lugs that, that keep on breathing. And he has a link uh, to a, a ad from Canada from uh, 1954 or 5 or so, focusing on the 1953 polio outbreak. And it talks about the fact that um, to uh-huh. keep these iron lungs going, they needed backup generators. And it's a, an ad for Caterpillar. And so they talk about mm-hmm. how they provided their generators. So as Anthony writes, as luck would have it, the ad copy focuses on a 1953 polio outbreak. You've mentioned your 1953 year of birth coinciding with the elucidation of the structure of DNA. Perhaps of equal numerological significance is that the Cold Spring Harbor Symposia on Quantitative Biology for that year was on viruses. And he gives a link to that. And uh, Mm. indeed, it's um, the viruses symposia uh, uh, Delbrick and Luria, and it's kind of weird when you read through it because I had forgotten about this that Delbrook had uh, s- insisted on standardization, declaring that the proper subjects for phage research were the T even phages and their host E. coli strain B. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> period. The phage <laughs> treaty. The yep. phage treaty. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I, I'm sure I looked at this volume when I was in graduate mm-hmm. school. It, it, it does. Uh, mm-hmm. Ring a bell. Now, I, I love these photos they have on these Cold Spring Harbor symposia. So here we have Max Delbruck, who would one day be a virology hero also. We have uh, Alan Garin. We have Leo Zillard, who was a physicist that came over, and he's got a suit or and Zillard. a tie. Zillard. Zillard. He's got a suit and a tie. And then Watson is sitting on the grass in shorts. <laughs> they look like cutoffs, in fact. Yes. Getting bitten alive by ticks. <laughs> on, on the front porch of a little house at Cold Spring Harbor somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's just funny, the, yeah. the contrast, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Hey, we only have two more, so let's get through them. Ruan writes, Dear Twiv, I'm a clinical virology resident at the University of Cape Town in South Africa and also spent some time in the phage therapy group at Imperial College London. It is a beautiful 23 degrees Celsius in Cape Town with clear skies and a great view of Table Mountain, as I type this email, sitting at the waterfront. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. We would like to thank you for one of your recent picks, biorender.io. It has changed my life. Oh, I think it's great. Why would make professional science figures in five in, in minutes? Oh, yes. I, don't mm-hmm. know, I, I think Brianne picked Maybe this Brianne, one. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Good. Also, RE Twiv495. I may be in clinical virology, and my academia experience was in phage-based cancer immunotherapy, but I've done a plaque assay, so I think I get to go on the world <laughs> list of virologists. Oh, sure. absolutely. Of course. You betcha. <laughs> Gert. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> Alan. Okay. Uh, Anthony the last sends a link too. about the, the future of podcasting is educational. I uh, totally I agree. 
yes, podcasters rather than conventional media or education, the education establishment are in a position to shape the tone and content of public discourse. And it's a whole article about how um, about 68 million Americans say they listen to podcasts, according to a 2017 survey. Mm. And um, uh, I'm a little jealous of this. Podcast generated revenue is up to 220 million dollars in 2017 and yeah where's, where's our where's ours <laughs> uh but anyway the the uh the field is growing and what it, the article talks extensively about what people are listening to which is a lot of educational podcasts it's not just the sports shows and and such it's uh stuff like us i guess well and those are the ones that don't make any money Yes, exactly. The, the money's politi- going to the yes. the politics and the sports and the comedy podcasts are the ones that make money. But the edu- oh, well. t- traditionally, we're a comedy podcast. We have some humor. <laughs> I mean, every time I say something, it's wrong. So that's pretty funny. I, guess. I, I actually was did a podcast with Stanford students, which we'll talk about when it comes out. But yeah. they intentionally try to be funny, yeah. and I said, I don't think you need to, but if you're just yourself. You'll end up being a little You're funny, funny enough, right? <laughs> You're probably funny enough, right? Uh, and there's a there's a take second the next one. Yes, this is also from Anthony, uh, <laughs> which is the flip side of the same thing. <laughs> it's an article called "Is the Podcast Bubble Bursting?" <laughs> and this is from Columbia Journalism Review, and it's about how um, uh, nobody can figure out how to make money off podcasting. So all the media companies that have tried investing in it, uh, they're they're shutting down um their their podcasting efforts but dixon should i write this columbia journalist say hey right here at columbia we chop liver or something (laughs) but you know they're talking about making money and saying how hard it is to do with podcasts but that's not why we do this that's why it's great for education right yes (laughs) if we did this for money's sake i'd be a lot thinner (laughs) yeah. <laughs> There's a tweet here. Everybody tells me that podcasting is a fantastic business to be in, which is why it's a bit weird that Panoply and now BuzzFeed are shutting down their podcast operation. Yes. Mm. Well, that's fine. Shut down everyone and leave us. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and, and both things can be true. And really, what's being said here about podcasting, you know, how hard it is to make revenue, this is true of the entire internet. Mm-hmm. I guess. And. The media industry has still not, I've been a science journalist for over 20 years, and I've been wondering the whole time, how are we going to pay for this? Because I've watched the whole rise of of media online, and it's just not at all clear how to do that. And everybody shrugs their shoulders and says advertising, but advertising rates are plummeting. And now we're pointing out that in podcasting, that's an issue. So, yeah, you know, the podcasts are going to be run by small operations like us and maybe mm-hmm. eventually we'll be able we'll be financially sustainable but in the meantime we're going to do it for fun as kathy would say it's a niche market yes <laughs> or would i say niche i don't know actually oh. i heard someone say niche at stanford you know really yes uh none of and this is a last paragraph from this article none of this is to say that podcasting is dead just like everything else it requires an investment of time and money To do well, something that not every media company has a lot of right Right. now. Perhaps it always made more sense as a niche market for a passionate few rather than the next big solution to the media's financial woes. We we didn't get into this for the money. We got into this to educate. And And um, because we're entertaining ourselves, we actually enjoy doing it. We enjoy doing this. We do. So, Kathy, do you say niche? I think (laughs) I say niche, actually. Niche. But uh, was it just. Uh, text message that I sent you that link. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. did. Okay. You did. That's why I'm saying it. Actually, <laughs> right. Because Kathy sent us a text message with niche in it a while ago. And uh-huh. It was pretty funny. Did uh-huh. you get it, Dixon? I I think I did actually. You don't tweet, do you? I don't. Okay, because there's a person tweeting under the name of Dixon de Pommier. I know that. I it's know fake, that. fake Dixon de Pommier. It says exactly. it's fake. fake account. It says it's yes. Fake. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. The thing is, when I get a notification, yeah. It just says Dixon de Pommier tweeted, and I'm That's like, too- "Wow, Dixon started!" Yeah. No, 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 he did know. not. <laughs> Wouldn't dare. But that the person who runs that account is very familiar with with what you've said on Twiv and Twip, and I, is I, actually keeping track. And, yeah, and, I, I think and, I know who it is. Insightful commentary. I, I think yeah. I know who it is, <laughs> and he's very fair. He or she yeah. is very. It's fair. a he. It's a he. Dixon. It, some people actually have fake accounts and say they're fake, but they're actually the real person. You know. Yes. Right. 
No, I do know that. Would you be pulling the wool? I would not. Over our eye? I would not. <laughs> okay. The nylon or the rayon? Neither Speaking one of, of wool. Either. No, I said the fake Depomia account has insightful comments. It does. Yeah, it yeah, does. So it couldn't possibly and they, be. They, they, <laughs> they, are, they are aware of the podcast also because they sure. make comments that- No, I know who this is. I think I know who this is. No, I don't think you know at it's all. someone who used to work for me. Oh, that could be. Yeah, I think it is. He's an innocent. Good guy. <laughs> innocent good guy. of what? No, he's a good guy. Speaking of wool, let's do some picks. Okay. Alan. What do you have? I for have us? a website called Compound Interest, which has nothing to do with finance and everything to do with chemistry. Get it? Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is somebody who is a chemistry professor who, in his spare time, just puts together these graphics. Hmm. And he has them. If you go to the site right now, he's got uh, graphics explaining the, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Nobel Prize in Physics, and Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. <clears throat> and what the research was behind them. Mm. Uh, so those are all there. And uh, then there's a whole bunch of, there's chemistry of uh, coffee and um, uh, <laughs> you know, gases for scuba diving, egg, chemistry of eggplants. Egg I'm not sure good. what. Chemistry of uh, eggplants. That's nice. Uh, I like that. Uh, it's like an Alton Brown piece. Chemistry of asbestos. <laughs> but nice figures. Uh, That's the thing here, the, the images. They're the nicely graphics. done. There's some online tool that I think does these because yeah. I've seen a lot in the same. <laughs> hey, maybe it's the thing we, yeah. that the guy maybe saved us. BioRender. Yeah, BioRender. <laughs> uh, so but he puts these together, and um, what actually got me to it is um, the one on classes of antibiotics, hmm. which he did a few years this ago, which cool. is a nice overview and also uh, if you look at the graphic what i thought was cool about it is that it puts them on a timeline for when they were first discovered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you can see the order in which these things came along so uh, there's no search thing but i'm oh yeah here it is let's search for virus let's see if he's got any virus stuff virus because you could imagine that um yeah there you go the cold virus mm -hmm. ebola Drugs for Ebola virus. Yeah, that's cool. You could do viruses. This week in chemistry. Yay! Twick. <laughs> <laughs> Twick. So he's got some virus. That's very cool. I like that. I like the idea of making a graphic. That's very appealing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, I used to. I thought podcasting would talking would be appealing, but apparently, according to the previous articles, graphics <laughs> are better. Right? That's nice. I like that very much. Mm -hmm. Dixon, what do you have? I have a follow up. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, I, I, I don't know how I happened onto this website that showed the latest uh, Japanese fireworks celebrating some local holiday. And I, I was stunned by the patterns that, that they can achieve using fireworks because we don't get them like that here. So then I went to Google search images and just typed out Japan fireworks and got the most amazing displays wow. of fireworks ever. Yeah. Ever. Wow. So, exactly. Yeah. Kathy, did you know that that stuff yeah. existed? I didn't, no, actually. No, but partway down, <laughs> there's a couple that look like viruses. Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, that's, so then I say amazing, spectacular displays of flame tests for the elements, because every one of those colors is an element, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, that's compound interest. That Alan, we're on the same yeah. wavelength. Yeah. It's beautiful. And they're, and they're cool. They're, they're really beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Stronium brings red. Yes. Calcium deepens the colors. That's right. It brings a silver color. Magnesium makes bright white. Lithium adds red. Nickel, wow. Nickel is yellow. Uh, gr uh, green, rather. It's copper. Very cool. And copper is you go green. far enough down, you get to something that looks like a couple of gourds with characters all yeah. over them. Yeah. I don't know. What, oh, the, but they're the, big because there's a pop can there. The thing it's that's wow. disturbing, the, though. The cartoon oh. cat is pretty amazing. <laughs> the, the, the disturbing part of fireworks, of course, is where does all that stuff go that yeah. doesn't burn up and you've got these elements that are just being thrown into the environment again so there are a lot of heavy metals in them and i'm i, I hope yeah. they all burn up and what happens when they burn up this is this they're is very japanese right? to oxidized. take a chinese invention and oxidized. just run with it yeah. <laughs> they're oxidized to another compound right? I, which yeah. they do falls they go to, to the earth they thing. fall to the earth and then they get recycled into the environment well they may but if these you're are ever, cool if you're ever on a beach where they're setting off fireworks, they all fall on the beach well, and yeah. get bits on the beach later. Yeah. Yeah, or into the water. That's cool. Very nice. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something that uh, I knew about. I've known about this for a long time, and there was a tweet about it recently. Um, and that is uh, 
that there is a bias in a lot of letters of recommendation, whether they're written by men or women. And when I was on the advanced program here, uh, we read the most, to me, the most famous of these, an article by Trix and Senka from 2003. And they did research um, and analyzed the contents of letters of reference for men and women. And that was for, for people who were successfully hired for faculty positions at a Midwest medical school. And so I've provided three primary references um, and then uh, the guidelines that are uh, kind of come out of these primary articles about how to avoid gender bias in reference writing. And it's been put together by the University of Arizona. Um, but the, the gist of it is that letters for men tend to be longer. Uh, they tend to mention scholarship and skills mm. and accomplishments. Le letters for women tend to be shorter and be sometimes more likely to mention personal life, something that's almost always irrelevant for the application. And so uh, when we've presented this in our stride presentations, uh, we have a couple of the quotes. One of them is, uh, she is close to my wife. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> not at all relevant to whether the person is qualified for the job. And the one that was on Twitter was, incidentally, and then uh, female scientist applicant, is also very good at making delicious cookies, which bring a lot of joy to stressful committee meetings. Oh, now, you would never see that in a letter of recommendation for a man, or I, I defy you to find something like that. So, if you're l writing letters of recommendation, whether you're male or female as the writer, uh, you can click on this link for the uh, Arizona guidelines and take a look at the letters that you've written. They encourage you to use formal titles and surnames for both men and women um, and just uh, follow some of these things. They have lists of words to avoid, uh, lists of words to use, and so forth. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear I've, Very been, doing, useful. I've been doing it right. Hmm? <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. All right. I have, I have one in the quarter picks. Uh, <laughs> my main pick is a blog by Rob Stryker, who is a virologist over at University of Wisconsin Madison. Met him a couple of years ago. He's it, uh, he heard my talk and he said, you know, I'm thinking of blogging, and I have this idea to make it interesting by relating it to Game of Thrones. And of course, I don't watch Game of Thrones, so I said, okay, well, whatever you can do to make it of general interest, try it. You never know. <clears throat> so. He's got this up, and it's called the Game of T Cells. <laughs> game of Thrones, right? You got it. Could have made a Game of Clones. Well, we did that already. That was Ben Tenover. Yeah. Uh, but he writes blog posts about HIV and kind of makes them uh, Game of Thrones like. Number twelve is the HIV reservoir different in people leaving living in Essos than Westeros which I don't understand because I don't watch. But anyway, it's got 13 <laughs> clones, and this is a, a site where you should go. Chronicling the epic battles between the immune system with HIV, other threats, and sometimes itself. So check it out. He would like a little twiv bump. So give Rob a cool. twiv bump. Check that out. And then something really, because Kathy likes Legos, mm -hmm. um, this is the Apple Park in Lego. I like Legos. And too. Apple Park is the new campus that they built and this is an incredibly detailed model. Wow. These are photos on <laughs> Flickr. Mm -hmm. 60, 34 different photos which show you how amazingly detailed yeah. these are. Yeah. The little tennis court. <clears throat> <laughs> it's it's just amazing. amazing. Yeah. And all the trees are little Lego. Oh, the trees yeah. are phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So That's I, great. my wife and I recently are trying to sell our kids Legos, you know? Mm. And so they're all in boxes, all mixed up. Mm. So what we did is you find a unique piece. There's a website called bricklink.com. You can type in the number of the piece, and it'll tell you what Kidding. sets it's in, and then the you can heavens. get an idea, right? Wow. I cannot tell you how much time we are spending. We're I'm looking at each other and sure. saying, I hate Legos. I hate it's Legos. like a puzzle. That you <laughs> and why, and are, are your kids are okay you with this? you selling this? Yeah, they're fine. They don't care anymore. 
You guys. I would I would snap a picture of it, put it on Craigslist, and say twenty bucks takes the lot. <laughs> Some people do yeah. that, um, okay. but I have sold a few Harry Potter ones for hundred twenty, hundred thirty oh. bucks. Right? Oh, if you have a box and, and that really helps. So <clears throat> otherwise, yeah. Watch the Antiques less. Roadshow. You'll find out. So some people <laughs> yeah. do okay. put it on Craigslist or uh, some local thing, and that's yeah. everything. But I, I just, you know, I remember building these with yep. my kids, and I just okay. feel that they should be given a good home, <laughs> not just all thrown into a box. Yeah, and as long as you're sure, because my cousin still laments the fact that her mom sold her ice skates in a garage sale <laughs> without asking her. Yeah, that, that's not good. Well, I have to tell you a story. When I was a kid, I used to have a lot of baseball pennants. Oh, do you this know is what, classic. Do you know what a pennant is? Sure. Oh, yeah. I had many. People would give them to me and collected all the old teams. When I was a kid, I kind of liked baseball. Now, I don't listen to any more sports, but back then I did. And I don't know why, but one day my mother took them all off the wall and put them in a garbage can out front. <sighs> and I don't remember how old I was, but I think at by then, I didn't care, but I remember looking, and there was a swarm of kids just taking <sighs> these pennants and running off. You know, we ha I had the Washington Senators. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. And at the time, I didn't care, but now, wow, I could have sold those. <laughs> yeah. so, of money. Uh, My uh, kids are okay with the Legos. Speaking <laughs> of antiques road shows, just as an aside, a woman came on the show with baseball cards, right? These were not just baseball cards. This was the first set of baseball cards ever printed and it was of the um the boston red sox mm. and the ball and they had been cut in order to fit onto an album and uh, she also had the provenance for this and everything was fine and the person looking at these cards just was stunned. They, she couldn't believe it. it was a woman that, that knew all about baseball she's absolutely fantastic to listen to and she says do you, have you ever had these praised and the woman looked at her and she said, no, I almost threw them out. And this woman almost fainted and had a heart attack. She says, would you like to know how much they're worth? And this woman says, of course. And she says, well, conservative estimate for the entire collection is over a million dollars. Wow. A, a million. Yeah, but you have to sell it. To get no, 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 no. <laughs> she could have auctioned it yes tomorrow Maybe. and got a million dollars. If I was that woman, I would have sold it to the Boston Red Sox. Two million dollars. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done, but I mean, that's what these things can Speaking be worth. Of auctions, right? Uh, let me tell this story. Sure. A few weeks ago, we had Ned Landau on Twiv. Yeah, we did. Right? That's right. That's right. So after we hung up, so Kathy and Alan and Rich didn't hear this part. He right. said, "I got to tell I you, I wasn't story. even on the show. You weren't even on the <laughs> no, show, no. but you, so you didn't hear it for sure. No, you were eating Mexican but food. Come only, on. <laughs> only Dixon and I heard this. He said, <laughs> that's right. "Oh, this was a great." Story. His uh, he grew up in New Jersey and his. Mom and dad, when they both passed away, they were selling. He and his brother were selling. And his father used to collect, come into New York and go to state sales and buy oil paintings. So he had a collection of 50 oil paintings. So they decided to auction them. So they went to a local auctioneer and they put them on an auction for like five, six hundred bucks, right? He said, one, so they're watching this auction one day, you know, just a guy in front of the room with a hammer and all this. And he said, one painting they get to, it starts going up 20,000, 40,000, 50,000. And he said two guys called in from Europe and started bidding against each other and eventually sold for $1.2 million. Wow. And so what was the pain? You can search this. <laughs> you can search this online. If you search Landau Rembrandt, because it turned out to be a oh. lost Rembrandt. Wow. An early, early Rembrandt. And it was one of the five senses. He had painted five paintings. When he was 16 senses. years old, he painted that. And his father had it, and they ended up cleaning Stored it. under a ping pong table. <laughs> Something and, uh, like that. They found uh, the, <laughs> the signature. So this European buyer immediately turned it around and sold it to a New York buyer for $4 million. Correct. Wow. But Ned says, you know, we had to give money to the auction house and yeah, to man. the taxes, and in the end, it wasn't very much, but- they had a, and he said, this painting hung above our dining room table <laughs> as we grew up. Amazing. How about that? Wow. It's wow. cool. cool. Fantastic. All right. We have a listener pick from Steve. Lots of biology videos. Lots. This is a YouTube link to a channel called, excuse me, Show Moves Biology. Give me a board and pen and I will make you fall in love with biology. So this is a dude who stands in front of a whiteboard and teaches you. And he's oh. doing something right because he's got a half a million subscribers. Wow. And I'm not even close. 
So I'm not doing something right, obviously. These are Oh wow. <laughs> so he's he's teaching stuff well, he's doing a lot of these are instructional videos in Hindi. Correct. And that helps. So shotgun <laughs> sequencing method in Hindi, thirty eight hundred mm-hmm. views. Why not? Yeah, I mean, hey, if you're if that's your native language and you need to do sequencing. Western yeah. blotting in Hindi? Yeah. PCR in Hindi is eight and a half thousand. Southern blotting in Hindi? I have to yeah. say the most viewed video on my YouTube channel is my one of my virology lectures translated into Spanish. Hmm. Okay. It's sixty wow. over sixty thousand views. He's got the Yuri Miller experiment. Yeah. Huh. Almost ten thousand views. Wow. <laughs> So anyway, thank you, Steve. That's yeah, Twiv five one four. Isn't nice. Hindi a, a restriction enzyme? <laughs> <laughs> Microbe.tv slash Twiv. If you use a podcast player, uh, you can search for Twiv and subscribe. We'd like it if you subscribe, so you get every episode. But it also gives us numbers. And if you use Overcast, please like every episode. How you do that? You just click on an episode of Twiv. There's a little star. There next to the episode, you just hit it and it stars it and it will make us push us up into the top science podcast so that more people will see us. Cost you nothing but a few seconds of your precious time and we would greatly appreciate it. But if you really like us a lot, you could send us a contribution. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you can do that, including being a patron over at Patreon. You could give us a dollar a month or more. If you have a Rembrandt, you could give us more. Give us more. Just give me the Rembrandt. We'll, we'll sell it. <laughs> and then, of course, if you have questions or comments or suggestions, twiv at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. The newly revised trichinella.org. The newly revised. Everything you always wanted to know about Trichinella spiralis. We're afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. You're welcome back. Thanks. Alan Dove is on Twitter as Alan Dove. He's at turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Enjoy Vin- the weekend. It's going to be a good one. Yeah. Well, in what sense? Weather. Good. It's going to be like today, I think. All right. Now, we're not supposed to talk about the weather anymore. We're, we're off the air now, aren't we? No. I, <laughs> no, not yet. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. How would you know, uh, will, by the way? But when you edit this, you could make it off the air. It turns <laughs> off the red light. That it well, needs. I could, but I Roxanne. usually don't. Come I think on, most. <laughs> I think most of what we say is, is publishable with very yes. few exceptions. By the way, I heard a podcast today. And the guy edits it heavily. He says, because it's boring. And I'm thinking, how do you know it's boring to other people? You can't make that decision. Exactly right. right. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. All right, let's see what we have here. The powder keg of the cell, it only works in mice. Dangers of a leaky pamper, the enemy within, double-stranded in mitochondria, which, by the way, is a takeoff on last week's title. Yes. Right? Stigmata mitochondria, staying below the ADAR. I like the last one. His ADAR is like a side thing in the story. It kind of is. It but is. I like it. What do you like, Kathy? Oh, I was just trying to figure out why it was a takeoff on last week's title because on the first thing on the thing it didn't say double stranded in Belgium. Okay. Um, oh, staying below the ADAR is nice. I like that. Or double stranded in stranded in mitochondria. I don't know. What do you like, Dixon? Well I told you I like the last one. Yeah, you like the analyst all right, we'll do stay, staying below the ADAR. Below the ADAR. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Someday we'll do an ADAR episode.